pro-life woman was arrested for the second time for silently praying near an abortion facility in the UK. But people know who you are and they know why you're here. Okay. Well, no, I'm not protesting. But then Isabel Von Spruce told officers that she wasn't engaging in any illegal activities in the buffer zone near the Birmingham abortion business, but rather praying silently in her head. Her arrest comes only weeks after a UK court cleared her of criminal charges for a near identical offense. And joining us tonight to discuss is Mary Margaret Olihan, senior reporter for The Daily Signal. Mary Margaret, great to have you with us. Great to be here as always. Apologize for the voice allergies, DC. You know all about that. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, let's talk about this story. I mean, the second time she has been arrested, your reaction to this? Well, first of all, it, you're right. This is the second time that Isabel has been arrested just for silently praying outside this abortion facility in this censorship zone. And what's wild about this is that we have on tape the officers or these UK authorities specifically saying, yes, you're being arrested because you were silently praying in your head in this censorship zone. So apparently these UK authorities think they can tr control your silent prayer. It's just wild. And so we saw this first time that Isabel was arrested in December, I believe, and she was cleared of those charges. Then she got arrested again. And unfortunately, I believe it was yesterday that British, the British um, authorities or lawmakers passed legislation saying that, yes, it's okay for these censorship zones to exist and they're going to enforce them and prevent more people from silently praying mm -hmm. for the unborn in these zones. Just, just wild. Yeah, it is wild. It's really hard to believe this is happening here. Uh, ADF, Alliance Defending Freedom, the, the law firm that represented her the first time around, they actually released a clip of... Uh, the interaction between her and the officer. Let's take a look. Now, I, I get what you're saying. I completely understand where you're coming from. But it's people's perception, isn't it? I think there has to be some measurable level of intimidation or harassment, and that's not something that we can do. Okay, then. Okay, then. So, what we'll start with is we're going to issue you with a ticket now, and if you don't leave the area, you'll then be arrested. Do you understand that? What do you think about that? It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> who would have thought that someone could be arrested for silently praying? I shared a clip of this, uh, the first arrest, on social media in December. And I remember all these people came out of the woodwork and they were like, no, she wasn't arrested for silently praying. She was arrested for silently praying in an abortion, in a censorship zone. So there's all these people out there that are okay with this. The fact that she's in the censorship mm -hmm. zone means she has no rights to silently pray. It's just wild. And then, of course, they're, they're ignoring the fundamental problem here is that if you believe that abortion is wrong, that abortion ends the life of a human baby, that abortion is murder, then you believe abortion is murder of an innocent human baby. And so silent prayer seems very, very very small compared to what's going on here. And so UK authorities are zeroing in on this activity when what's happening in the abortion facility is in effect a much greater crime than what's going on outside. Uh, and it's, it's also really disturbing because in the United States right now, we don't have this happening, but we can see it going that way very quickly. You know, yeah. we saw Mark Halk targeted by the Biden administration for praying outside an abortion clinic with his son. He was he pushed an abortion clinic volunteer who was harassing his son and all of a sudden, a year later, the Biden administration shows up and arrests him at his house in front of all of his children. Um, so we've also seen all these pro-life pregnancy centers targeted by vandals and the Biden administration doesn't seem to have a lot of interest in figuring out that. And it's just, it worries me, Tracy. It seems like we're heading down a path where pro-lifers in our country also are facing similar discrimination and similar very scary repercussions from authorities just for praying for the unborn. Yeah, it's scary. A couple more things I'm going to get to, and we're running out of time. But yesterday was International Women's Day. Of course, mm -hmm. you know that. Speaking <laughs> of the Biden administration, uh, they gave an award to somebody who was um, actually a biological male that's been getting a lot of flack from mm -hmm. a lot of people. Yes, uh, the Biden administration on International Women's Day gave an award to a biological man. And at this point, I'm not even surprised. I heard that and I, I was like, I'm surprised this hasn't happened yet. I believe it was Jill Biden that gave the award to this biological man. And what baffles me, Tracy, is <laughs> we already have so much pushback to this kind of thing. You know, Rachel Levine, this transgender Biden administration official, also a biological man. The Biden administration knows exactly what they're doing. And they chose this day to make a statement to the American people saying, we're not backing down. Here's a biological man, and we're going to honor him as a woman. It's such an insult to me, to you, to mm -hmm. every other woman 
who, you know, we have these unique and strong capabilities that no man has and no man can have. We're women. And uh, the Biden administration apparently has <laughs> no interest in promoting those special qualities about us and is instead promoting this ideological, um, very aggressive principle that they are intent on pushing. Yeah, and I know you report on a lot of this. and. Speaking of reporting and journalism, tomorrow we have a conference coming up. EWTN News yes. and Franciscan University is sponsoring it tomorrow at the Museum of the Bible. You are going to be there. Yes. Very excited to talk about it. Have you on the panel with me. Um, let's talk about that. Why do you think this is so important mm -hmm. to talk about um, journalism in a post-truth world? It's so important because we have very little journalism nowadays. I think if you look at a lot of this mainstream or liberal reporting, half of it is coming from an ideological or very, very far left standpoint. I mean, even today, there was an article from the Washington Post talking about um, priests being on dating apps. And in this article, they tried to say it was up for discussion about whether priests should be on dating apps and whether priests should be looking at inappropriate mm -hmm. content. That's the Washington Post trying to say, hey, we're going to we're going to start helping people think about this and maybe we'll change how people talk about it. That's not okay. That's the the, the Washington Post should know there's Catholic Church teaching on whether something is right or wrong, but they are willing to mess with that. And that's what you see from a lot of news outlets nowadays. They want to change how people think about things, and so they mess with how we talk about it. And that's not journalism. Journalism is reporting the truth and telling people what's going on and giving it to them to think about and decide for themselves how they feel about it. And yes. that's not what we're seeing. And I think that this conference will be really helpful in helping us talk about what we should be seeing and how we can promote that and how we can help people to make that happen and to report the truth. Absolutely. And you always do that. And we're always so grateful to you for doing it. Thank you so much, Mary Margaret. Thank you.